like what advice would you recommend to like other short sellers who like read the report? Like, would you say like they should just go short right away? Like if they read your report or they shouldn't go off your report at all? Um, Cause like when you release them, like sometimes these stocks tank, right? So um, would you recommend someone just slam the bid after they read your report or? Yeah, everyone watching could just slam the bid whenever we release our report <laughs> all day long and for the next couple of days. Um, that would be great for me. What's going on, everybody? Uh, we're here with a very special episode of the After Hours podcast. Uh, today we have Sam, uh, who works with Carisdale Capital. Uh, Carisdale Capital is an investment management firm um, and specifically focused on, uh, I believe, short activism. So we're really excited to have you on, man, and thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Cool. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So I want to start off with a very basic question, something we always ask, but how did you get yourself involved in uh, markets, equities, and all that stuff? Um, I used to want to be a journalist. So I, um, during college, I worked for my college paper, and then I got a summer job at a newspaper up in Canada, the National Post. So uh, oh, it was for the business section up there. That was after junior year, after senior year, I then got a job at the Globe and Mail. And, uh, you know, I wanted to write for the business sections because I thought it would be interesting. I became an economics major, was sort of interested in that, but I mainly wanted to be a journalist. And then um, I read uh, the Warren Buffett biography by Roger Lowenstein and I read The Intelligent Investor. So, you know, I thought to myself, hey, if this journalism thing doesn't work out, um, investing doesn't seem too hard. So the journalism thing didn't work out. Um, and I moved down to New York, got an investment banking job, and then uh, went to a hedge fund and then started my fund. That's really cool. Did you have like ever any dreams of like, I don't want to say day trading or like actually trading the stocks intraday and all that stuff? Or was it always the idea of I want to be a long term investor, um, slow and steady, like Ben Graham says? Yeah, a long term investor. That's very cool. Very cool. And then how, how old are you when you started uh, at Carisdale? I launched Carousel when I was 29, I think. That's really cool. So how do you, how do you take that step from uh, working at a hedge fund to now starting your own thing? Like, was that jump like super, super difficult or was that jump kind of like a bit easier for you? Um, so my fund at the time wasn't, you know, it was a distressed fund and they had a uh, part of their assets in less liquid assets in 2009. Uh, so they weren't doing that great. And, um, you know, the real options were switching to another fund or starting my own thing in 2009. And yeah. I just felt that, um, you know, why not go for it? Uh, job market wasn't super hot early 2009. And so, you know, I thought to myself, let me, um, you know, launch the fund, start building a track record. And if it doesn't work out after two or three years, I could, um, you know, go back and work for another fund. But, uh, you know, in the end, it worked out. So, um, you know, I, I think when you're younger, there's less, um, you know, it's less risky. You have less to lose, right? If it doesn't work out, whatever, you go get another job. Um, and I've seen uh, a number of funds, um just start out when, when the manager is very young um, with very little assets and, uh, you know, they've grown nicely. So I think it's, it's doable. How, how, when you, when you, when you went from the hedge fund, you launched Caresdale, what, what guided you into selecting these companies that you decide to research and especially the ones that you consider overvalued? Sure. So initially, I mean, I launched with $300,000. So very little money. Um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, one of the ways I can get my name out there is by writing uh, reports on some of the stocks that I owned um, or just, you know, providing this research for free. You know, Twitter wasn't really a thing then. Seeking Alpha didn't really have the sort of sophisticated articles it has now. There wasn't a, this concept of sharing ideas on the Internet. Um, hedge funds doing so wasn't really a thing. Now it is, you know, Substack is replacing a lot of sell side research just in terms of quality of content. Short activists are, um, you know, very present in the marketplace. Uh, people are sharing ideas all the time. The idea sharing websites 
are, um, you know, great ways to source ideas. This stuff didn't really exist back in 2009. Um, and so, you know, my idea was to start this email list, share the research more broadly and get my name out there. And so I started doing that in 2009 when I launched. Um, and then um, one of the areas I started looking at were these Initially, it was SPACs that were buying Chinese companies. And so that was sort of my first introduction to why um, there are misaligned incentives for SPAC sponsors. Um, because basically, SPACs were acquiring Chinese companies at like two times PE, but there was no company. There were fake companies. And so, um, you know, you'd think to yourself, well, why would a seller sell his company at two times PE? Well, if he was making all the numbers up, sell it at one times PE. It's like it's all right. Fake. Right. And so um, so I started looking at these SPACs um, and uh, after about six to eight months of researching, I realized there was a lot of fraud, um, but they were making up their numbers. So you couldn't just sort of short the stocks. You had to actively expose them. So I began exposing them. Um, and, you know, a lot of modern day, a lot of short activism developed out of that, you know, before people exposed the Chinese companies. It was just Andrew left of Citron Research with his blog. Um, Muddy Waters came out with the first ever real uh, full length report in April 2010 on Orient Paper. I wrote on a company, China Marine Food, uh, under a pseudonym, it's like Chinese company analyst, um, on Seeking Alpha. And um, then I sort of came out with the Keras, I did a, everything under Keras still in November of that year. Um, Citron came out with something on China Biotics a month later and, you know, short actors really developed, um, out of that. Um, so it wasn't originally, I wasn't intending to share research on shorts, but once I figured out that all these companies were just making up their numbers, um, you know, it was a great way to, to, uh, to generate some PL. And so, you know, I started using the research and sort of the platform. Uh, on the short side. Um, and then investors came, you know, came to us and said, Hey, you know, this is pretty interesting. And they started giving us capital for short activism. So I became a short activist, but it wasn't really, that wasn't really the intention when I launched the fund. I wanted to just go long stocks, like. <laughs> Damn, that is actually crazy. You're kind of like a, like a pioneer for this type of stuff, you know, like, like you were just kind of like, it just kind of like happened, but like, you're kind of one of the first people, like once the internet like was really happening that like, you know, that were like, that were like out, like doing this activism, you know? Um, so when you uh, kind of like launch a report, how would you, uh, like what advice would you recommend to like other short sellers who like read the report? Like, would you say like, they should just go short right away? Like if they read your report or they shouldn't go off your report at all. Um, cause like when you release them, like sometimes these stocks tank, right? So, um, would you recommend someone just slam the bid after they read your report or? Yeah. Everyone watching could just slam the bid whenever we release our report <laughs> all day long and for the next couple of days. Um, that would be great for me. Uh, <laughs> my recommendation to all of your listeners. Um, you know, so we've done probably 100 campaigns, 100 shorts. You know, I have a lot of experience in this. Um, we've gotten things wrong. Other people get things wrong. Um, you know, we try to take pains to do very high quality research. I think one of the things at Carysdale is, look, we can control whether these stocks go up or down or what happens or what's happening with the market. You know, um, it's like you release a research, you hope you create a dialogue. People care, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes you know, meme stocks are in favor and the market's just rallying. Um, but at the end of the day, we try to do very high quality research. We can control the research. We can't necessarily control what's happening in the market. And, you know, I think, uh, hey, I think we've gotten better over the years in terms of the quality of our research. Um, and then B, you know, I think we're seeing, we've been seeing a lot of success over the past couple of years. Um, and it's a function of the marketplace recognizing the Carousel does do high quality research. Um, and I think as long as that's the case, we'll hopefully get a lot of things right, but we don't. And, you know, as practitioners of short activism, we know that, you know, people get things wrong. And so, 
Um, we look at opportunities where other short activists have published a report, but they're wrong. Those can be great opportunities on the long side. Um, so uh, I don't know if I have a recommendation, but people should just read the research, you know, see if they, they agree with it. And if it's an attractive short, then it's an attractive short. Um, and if they do I, slam the bid, you know, if they decide to just slam the Be bid, quick about it. That's absolutely hilarious. Um, one thing that was kind of spread all over Twitter was after you released, and I don't know if you can talk about this or not. And if you can't, that's fine. But one thing was that, that uh, like lawsuit that you got hit with after you uh, released the, the AI short report. Um, was that, was that, because I just read it on Twitter. Was that like real at all? Like, was that like a real, like actual like lawsuit that you guys got hit with? Yeah, we're, we're in the middle of it now. We have, um, you know, I think it's a frivolous lawsuit. Um, it was actually a lawsuit filed against the letter we wrote, you know, the six page letter. So you can read yeah. that six page letter yourself and, yeah. um, you know, come to your own conclusion on whether we'd be liable for anything under this letter mm -hmm. that we sent to Deloitte, you know, pointing out issues we see with the company's accounting and then encouraging them to take their audits seriously. I don't know where the liability in, in such a letter, you know, comes. so I think it's a frivolous lawsuit, um, but we have, you know, we're going through the court process and we follow motions. And I think uh, right now it's a bit of a waiting game. Um, the, the ball is in the, the judge's court. Um, and, you know, they'll review it. Some of these systems are, are slow, but yeah, it was real. And I'd, I'd never seen a class action lawsuit against a short activist. Me before. either. Me yeah. either. That's why I thought it was made up. I thought that it was like <laughs> completely made up. So then when I saw you, that, well, when I heard that we could have you on, I was like, damn, I got to ask him about this. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I saw it too, I hadn't been served yet. So I'm like, <laughs> this is new. I think I got served like a week later, so. Yeah. Interesting. So as, as a trader or investor, like we know that using confidence and having confidence in your own ideas is so important. When you get hit with like negative reaction from the companies that you're, you're suing or people that are companies that you're shorting or investors in that company that are, that are upset, you know, does that ever, is that hard for you to then maintain the course and like get like, keep going on your idea or do you ever get like stressed out or frustrated by the reaction you receive? I don't think so. I, no. uh, yeah, I've just been doing this for a long time and, um, it's been a lot of negative comments. Yeah. Me, uh, personally about my fund, you know, so I think we get a lot of angry voicemails, um, <laughs> emails, uh, I've gotten Facebook Damn. messages, I've got Facebook DMs. <laughs> Uh, from upset investors so you know i've pretty much seen it all uh i don't know if it really um you know impacts my conviction but we uh just on the fundamentals uh y you know we're we're interested in hearing what what others have to say and um you know a lot of people just like call me names but uh but people who post on twitter you know genuine counter arguments um, you, you know, we look at those and, um, you know, if we, if we, if it changes our mind, well, we usually don't sort of like, you know, write about how it impacts our thinking. We just sort of let the original report just sort of stand on its own. Um, but you know, we can close a position out if, if we feel that we're wrong, but that happens very rarely. Um, you know, I think most of the time when we get trades wrong, it's because, of stuff that happens with the market, you know, like Carvana, for instance, that stock Carvana and AI, I think those stocks ultimately doubled a month or two after publication. At this point, I think um, AI has retraced all the way back down, but Carvana back. on its way down. Um, but, you know, I think we're right about our original thesis, uh, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at what people have to say and, and, sometimes respond to it, but usually just sort of like use it um, to sharpen our own thinking on, on the stock. And our... Did you guys take a loss on AI and Carvana or was it more of like break even or did you guys like cover right away or like how'd that work? AI was profitable. Carvana was a loss. Yeah. When you target these stocks as a potential short selling position, like I'm going to, I'm considering a short on this. What is one or several of the things 
that actually puts that stock on your in your radar, puts it in your sights. What exactly do you see in the beginning that makes you go hold the phone, folks? You know, so the fundamentals are important. Um, and so we want to come up with ideas where we're right about the short, um, to the extent we can find ideas where we don't think the company is going to be around six or seven years from now, you know, their terminal zeros, uh, those can be a little bit more interesting than just valuation shorts, although we've published on valuation shorts in the past. Um, and then we want to, we want to have a discussion in the marketplace. And so there are some ideas that, um, where the thesis can be a little bit too complex, where we've started moving away from those types of names. So we used to write a decent amount in biotech and healthcare. Uh, if you look at our reports in 2017, 18, 19, you know, we would publish on some of these stocks. And I think by and large, we got the arguments right on the vast majority of them. But sometimes the arguments were so complicated that it was hard to change the market's opinion, change sell size opinion. Um, and so, you know, we've stopped doing things in healthcare just because the arguments are too complex. Um, and so we've gravitated towards names where, you know, we think that if we share our research, um, you know, it'll, there'll be talk, there'll be discussion um, as a result of it and, and people will engage with our reports uh, and, and we can impact what people's thinking around these stocks are. Yeah. I know, I know a while back Citron uh, had mentioned that they were going to stop, I think, publishing um, their short letters, you know, especially online, because they just didn't want to deal. I think a lot with the retail uh, like attacks and everything that came after that. You know, how do you see the future of short selling, um, especially with this giant increase in, in retail trading and you know, it's become very popular to, to trade stocks and, and try to squeeze folks? So how do you see the future of this kind of this game for you? You know, I think the market continues to be healthy for short activists. You know, we published on Tilray a couple of weeks ago. I think we were able to trigger the debate on that on that stock. Um, and, you know, we've seen good engagement on most of our reports over the past year. You know, I think other short activists are experiencing sort of similar trends. Um, it depends on the quality uh, of the activists work and you know there's there's a range there there are some short activists that do better work than others um you know we try to do we try to be um you know in the top tier there um and i think for the top tier providers they're having a lot of success i mean look at hindenburg this year right i mean right. Uh, carl icon a uh, giant company in india uh he's getting plenty of traction with his ideas so I don't know if short activism um, is doing too bad right now. Um, so, so far, it's promising. Yeah, um, I'm sure that you follow kind of like the GME, AMC, Wall Street bets situation. Um, if there's any apes listening, uh, what would you what would you say? To I them? mean, I don't think the idea of like trying to gang up and squeeze short activists really works. Um, <laughs> we've had we've had situations because we monitor Twitter and the Reddit boards. We've had situations where, you know, Redditors have gotten together and said, you know, like like over the weekend, like this Monday, let's all show up and squeeze Carousel. And Monday shows up with like stocks down four percent. Like it just doesn't really work. Right? You can't like, you can't like tell a whole bunch of your buddies like let's go buy a stock and squeeze a short activist. You know, short squeezes are definitely a thing. They occur on a regular basis, but who knows like what causes them? There's like things in the market inherent in the market structure on that day that causes these squeezes. It's not like a bunch of people getting together and like deciding to squeeze someone. Like I remember the um, the uh, um, Twitter spaces that you know Codes and others used to organize on AMC, like trying to engineer squeezes and like whenever they do it, like the stock <laughs> go down. <laughs> so, so will you be a uh, spe uh, uh, will you actually go watch Dumb Money? Or have you seen it already? Uh, what's the, is that? A, is that a, oh, he hasn't even heard of a new movie? No, I, is that like a new documentary? It's it, well, I. It's more of a 
Mocking. dramatization of the actual event where you know everybody is represented by a, an actor and you know there's big people like seth rogan who plays one of the fund managers and stuff like that and so uh we have a we have a friend of a friend that was uh familiar with uh with roaring kitty and um uh and he said it was actually pretty accurate to what happened on their side of things from what they understand and so yeah it'd be interesting speaking of amc and gme i just wanted to know yeah i'll definitely go watch it when's it when's it coming out it's out right now it just came out yeah, it just came out like last week or something like that yeah no, really? i will yeah I'll definitely watch it so of these stocks that you're looking at for one most one that's most familiar to me is pltr and of those particular stocks, you know, we're most of our audience is day traders. These are people that are in and out and don't really pay a lot of attention to the fundamentals, but they can get really sucked into it and that can bias their decisions on whatever their whatever trade they're trying to make. Is there any particular red flags or telltale signs that you would tell a day trader? This is something you should really pay attention to on a particular stock before you start getting uh, a bias position, whether it be long or short. Well, so we're very fundamentally focused um, at the end of the day. You know, every company is with the present value of its future discounted cash flows. And we go long stocks that, you know, where the market price is, is below um, what, you know, DCF would spit out. And we're short where the stocks are you know, market caps or enterprise values are higher than what the DCS would spit out. Um, the, my only like real contribution to trading and thinking trading about around trading is just, you know, try to find what consensus thinking is, what's crowded. And if you can take the other side of that, or if you're sort of joining the crowd, you know, think very, carefully about whether you agree with the fundamentals so my you know all i can tell anyone on trading is just you know don't get sucked into what the crowd is thinking That'll be yeah one of my favorite tools well, that i've talked about here before is the um uh i don't remember what what it was rob robin robin tracker was that it yeah that it was, was like uh it was a popular tool. It was one of my favorite. And this was back, you know, when the hype of, you know, when Tesla in 2018 was running to a thousand for the first time, man, you could hop on Robin, Robin tracker and just whatever, whatever ticker reached the number one, number two position, let it sit there for a day or two. And dude, it would inevitably crash hardcore. And that kind of plays off of that crowd hype uh, mentality that once everybody kind of joins that, it dies off, right? Once the hype is dead, it dies really hard. Are there any specific tools or resources that you use today that kind of assist in finding that crowd hype? Um, nothing too sophisticated. Uh, you know, I just sort of track what people are saying on Twitter, what people are saying on Reddit, and then, you know, the hedge fund community where people are talking about in, in sort of the hedge fund world. So occasionally you get these ideas where a bunch of hedge funds start talking about it. They get presented at it, idea dinners. And, you know, we just keep hearing about it from like other managers, other professional investors. There's the idea sharing websites, you know, Value Investors Club and some zero. You see ideas, you know, get pasted, get posted three or four times in a two or three year period. You know, those are the crowded names. And if you come up with an idea that's not getting posted on the idea sharing websites, no one's talking about the idea dinners. Um, you know, you don't see a whole bunch of people pitching it and telling you to look at it. Um, you know, then it's just probably not crowded. Uh, if you don't see a bunch of hedge funds from the holders list. And, and then if you don't see it anywhere on Twitter, if you don't see it anywhere on Reddit, you know, those are uncrowded names. And, you know, I find those are my favorite opportunities. Um, ultimately, the fundamentals are what matter. Again, so I'm not a trader, so none of this is really applicable to your, your to your listeners. But um, but when I agree with the fundamentals and no one else is talking about it and it's not crowded, you know, I find those to be 
uh, my favorite trades, my favorite investments. Um, and then there are times where I like the fundamentals of the story. Um, and I'll, even if it's crowded and a bunch of people are talking about it, you know, I'll buy the stock and, you know, I'll just like deal with the volatility and regret my decision at some point, usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they're also linked, right? If, if everyone's talking about a stock and posting on it and, yeah, you go to Value Investors Club and they're, they're, you know, there are four or five posts in the past couple of years, like usually it's not the best stock. You know, if you do your sort of um, genuine fundamental analysis, unbiased, um, objective uh, analysis into the stock, you'll come away, uh, you know, less optimistic typically, because if everyone is talking about it, then, you know, the story is out there. If it's such an attractive stock, the price would probably reflect it. Um, whereas stocks that nobody is talking about, um, you know, I think that's where you can find real opportunities. Um, and then, you know, for us, we have a platform. So if we really like something, we'll write a report, send it out there, um, and, and hope that discussion revalues it higher on the long side. And then we call them side chicks, the, the unknowns that are just hanging out there that, you know, Best opportunities right there. The best opportunity is not always the hot chick. It's not always the most talked about stock. Hey, it's the it's hard to do original work, but if if anyone's out there doing it, you know, it's sort of the best way to make money. Yeah. I had a question on risk. Now, have you ever been stopped out of a short um and then ultimately been proven wrong and kind of missed the move that that later came, or have you have you never really had to deal with that yourself? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, if you like, if you stick to your guns on shorting as a hedge fund, you'll be out of business as a trader, you'll lose all your money. Yeah. You know, shorting is not anywhere. It's not the place you want to be a hero. Correct. Um, you'll get your face ripped off yes. it's not that all the time. <laughs> 14 years of doing this. Yeah. <laughs> you have thick skin. I can't even, I can't even. You know, no, it makes list sense. the number of times I've been stopped out and then like been right about the thesis. I mean, like, right. I find we're typically right about the thesis, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the trades are profitable. Yeah. Have, as a fund manager, how do you determine risk on, on certain trades like that? Are you like, do you have an A, is it like an A plus setup to you, right? Like that kind of idea? Or is it like, you know, each different time you attack a company, you're going to increase your risk depending on your how certain you are that it's going to go down kind of thing? Um, how do you determine that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So some ideas, you know, we like better some ideas, you know, we believe in the fundamentals, but from a risk management standpoint, you know, we make those positions smaller. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, you know, the quality of the idea, um, the market environment, you know, April, 2021, you're probably sizing things differently than, um, you know, middle of 22, for instance. Um, I remember Hindenburg came out with a report back then. I think it was like February 21. And he like came out with a report and he's like, we don't have a position. <laughs> 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 the market environment definitely impacted his position sizing there and that he had no position. So, <laughs> um, like had the report then, so he came out with a report. Um, that, that was a sign well, all this work went into this research, so I guess I'm just going to put it out there, but I'm not yeah, trading like, the hidden version <laughs> of that. And I think that was within weeks where Citron, uh, announced that he was no longer shorting. And that was like the top of the market, you know, yep. <laughs> destroyed over the next 18 months. Um, uh. retrospect was obvious. But, um, yeah, you know, so market environment will impact our position sizing. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot, you know, we've, we've just done this a lot over, over many years. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we have a sophisticated perspective on how to go about the strategy. Absolutely. That's a, that's super cool. Um, recently, like about in the past six months, we had this sector where there were tons of like China junk stocks just going like to the moon. Um, did those ever hit your radar to maybe do some like activism on, or maybe you did some? I think all of those are just too small for us. You know, we want at least like 10, $15 million ADV. 
and 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 borrow available and i think a lot of those like china like i don't know i don't know what that stuff is right like who's doing it and trading it like we watch it um but it's it's just too like a lot of that stuff's just too small for us to trade so our focus isn't there versus stocks where we can build sort of more meaningful positions and get borrow and stuff yeah and uh also recently you uh did the whole short report on tilray maybe you could kind of explain uh how you went about that process to our viewers yeah so you know we like stocks that are on the shorts where management is, is constantly diluting shareholders and um you know i think on the short side we like situations where you know the crowd has has gotten to the stock and sort of you know, you know the long side gets crowded but the thesis is wrong and so what's happened what happened with the marijuana stocks is that the legislation the progress on legislation in the u.s um is good for most wheat stocks like the msos but it doesn't imp it doesn't really help the canadian licensed producers and yet they had participated in the rally um partly because you know they've been heavily shorted and, and the stocks have done so badly and um and so you know tilray benefited from that so it was up a lot on the marijuana news but really wasn't benefiting from the legislation um and then you know, those Canadian players are just continue just to be in a world of hurt because they're they're really competing with, you know, uh, individual private farmers and much smaller companies. And it's an oversaturated market. Supply and demand is not in their favor. They're not generating profit. Tilray has been trying to diversify into other lines of business. They bought Anheuser-Busch craft, craft beer business. We think that that acquisition doesn't make a whole lot of sense and won't be successful. And what goes better than beer and weed? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, like, if it was, I think just for them, you know, that craft craft beer is it's a very local market, you know, so acquiring all right. of these sort of like craft beer brands that Anheuser Bush wants to get rid of is probably not gonna be very successful. You know. <laughs> Seems kind of like a uh, just a guilty pleasure of someone in on the board or in very far upper management at your point. You know what? I want a craft brewery. <laughs> it's a main <laughs> purchase. Yeah. You know, we talk about this in the report, but I think, you know, the CEO or Erwin Simon um, has a prior track record. You know, he, he sort of ran Hain and the stock went up a lot and then it went down a lot. And we have this sense that he just likes to acquire things and like make deals, but like, the whole thing doesn't really make a whole lot of much sense. And Hain um, was a good example of that, where he was just acquiring a bunch of stuff. But, um, you know, those, those acquisitions didn't play out um, as originally anticipated. And the stock has done pretty badly. Hain's done pretty badly. And he's sort of doing the same thing with Tilray, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I think when you acquire stuff, you have to have... Um, you know, a sound basis for doing so and should be accretive. And I'm not really sure that's what he goes for, his track record of not really. Um, so you mentioned these 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 particular CEOs that kind of have a have a habit of going off of the rails. Is there kind of like a, a little list, like a blacklist of if these particular CEOs take take a role in a company you immediately target that company as a potential short later on are you following any of these people um in what they do professionally uh, there, there are there are actually some that we do follow yeah um, the habitual offenders <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i find i don't know if it's like our it's not like our number one screening tool um no, you know we have a team right so um you know, some of the investment professionals probably use that as more of a sourcing tool than others. Uh, for the most part, you know, our team's pretty experienced. And so I, I let them source ideas, you know, how, how they think is best um, versus sort of superposing some process on, on what they do. Um, and, and I'm sure, um, you know, they do look at the players, but 
we like situations where, you know, the stock has done well and people have crowded into a name and we can publish on it. And so sometimes we're reacting to things that have gone parabolic, um, areas of the market that have gotten hyped up. And then we do research on it and we say, oh, well, there's that there's that CEO that we saw before or that, um, uh, you know, pipe fund and their capital structure or whatever the case may be, you know, whatever sort of some of these players that we've seen before and, and we like to take the other side of. I remember when we were doing the Chinese fraud uh, trade, there was one fund that if they were invested, you know, we sort of for a while, for a couple of months, we just went after all the names in there. <laughs> now one of the analysts from it, like we were really good friends, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just business. They, they they thought that the companies were were real. Um and then as the short activism came out, you know, they sort of realized that they weren't real. And so then they started shorting the stocks themselves. I mean, as day traders, that's a side of fundamentals that we can really appreciate is there are those particular funds that just have a tendency to do that really toxic financing. And you know, if they're involved, there's some shysty business going on and they're going to offer it some ridiculous price based on these warrants or this or that or anything. And you mentioned pipes as well. There's, there's, um, there's a Twitter guy, Auspects Research, that is he wrote this huge back in the day of when twit longer was a thing he wrote this huge thing about uh the the habitual offenders on the pipe on the pipe list and uh i think that's one that day traders can really appreciate is pay yeah attention. I mean, we um we actually wrote a report on uh ffie faraday future oh cool yeah and we had the report and we're sort of sitting on it and you know we started seeing these pipe funds in there and i'm like you know what we won't issue the report. Like, I don't want this trade to be crowded. This is just going to be the gift that keeps on giving. So we just shorted the stock, went down. And then, like, every time it would pop, I'm like, oh, should we come up with a report? I'm like, nah. Like, short is just <laughs> below, the, the bar cost is still below 10%. We'll just, like, short, short more. And How do you make that choice? We sort of, like, actually didn't put out the report because it's sort of like, I thought rather than getting the name crowded, because part of the problem with our reports is, you know, we get some of these names crowded. I mean, if you look at what happened with AI, et cetera, you know, like is part of that squeeze because Carestale came out with the report, right? Um, and so- FFIE, The case can be made. In that situation where now you have that knowledge, are there any situations where you are, uh, in terms of like protecting risk profiles and things like that, are there strategies that you've put in place that you know- when you put this short report out, you need to put it out. But the the herbs of the retail world are probably going to try to run this up. Do you do anything as a fund to protect against that and maybe hedge that position? Yeah. So I don't. I actually was saying I think that it's it's. I think one of the impact of the increased participation by retail in the stock market is actually there's a lot more people shorting stocks right you sort of don't talk about it. you talk about you you hear about the apes and you know people buying amc and robin hood but as retail has got like most most investors aren't like buying amc stock on the long side you know like some of them talk about it and they put out ape memes but like most people don't want to lose money in the market right? They want to make money in the market. So you're likelier to have your sort of typical retail investor actually be short AMC than be long AMC. People don't really talk about this, but like it's sort of intuitive, right? Like AMC has, has been a short for a long time, you know, like the lever and these, these uh, movie theaters aren't going to generate enough cash flow to cover their debt, right? And so you sort of, you know, they get heavily shorted and, and people think it's just hedge funds shorting the stock. I'm not sure that's true. I think it's a lot of retail shorting these stocks. These names, they get crowded. You know, when like Carvana gets crowded or ANC gets crowded. I think it's a lot of retail shorting the stocks that's making uh, that's making it a crowded short, causing those high short interest then causing those squeezes. And is it funds that are just trying to make a market that see that kind of that aggressive shorting 
you know, because most of them, they're not trying to add liquidity. They're just whacking a bid or they're just going in at the market. Do you think that that is something that's that's guiding it to be pushed up just based on the fact that market makers are trying to keep liquidity in that base? And it's not physical people probably inside an algorithm or something like that. Yeah, I think there is some of that going on. And then just when a lot of people are short of stock and, um, you know, they all go to cover because the Nasdaq's up 2%, you know, it's going to squeeze, right? So, um, you know, again, like, what are the crowd of trades? And, you know, do you want to be there? Do you want to take the other side? I think, um, you know, on some of these, some of these shorts, there's not that many people, you know, there's just a lot more people short them or, you know, than, than long. Than we think. That's, that's, I'm not really sounding very very intelligent in how I'm doing this. <laughs> but, we, never do, we never do here, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah but don't worry, buddy. Exactly. That, the bar's yeah, real low here. The shorts <laughs> are just going to squeeze because all these shorts are going to cover when it's sure. so obvious that the stock is a short. Yeah, um, right. And I think that's when you see squeezes. And then, yeah, there are probably quant funds um, that prey on that and, and extend the squeezes. And there's stuff going on in the derivatives market. Um, but, you know, I'm not an expert on market structure. That stuff's pretty complicated. You mentioned kind of that you mentioned about Citron and you mentioned about Hindenburg and you mentioned about some other uh, hedge funds and stuff like that. Do you ever talk to like Citron or Hindenburg or do you ever like talk to a hedge fund and say, Hey, I'm going to put this report out. Are you guys just all independent and you don't want to share any information at all? I think everyone's pretty independent. Um, we don't, we don't talk to them and share our research with them. We don't want other people short our names, um, you know, to the extent, you know, if other people know about our reports and they short the stock and when they cover, um that can cause issues so we do our own thing um and don't really work with others and i think that's the case with with most people i mean uh but i don't know i mean there are i think there are also short activists to do more collaboration there's guys out there that provide capital to uh, some of these anonymous short activists or some of these smaller players that don't necessarily have a fund, you know, there's folks that, that give them capital and, you know, we just don't, that world doesn't make a whole lot of, you, we don't really participate in, 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 in that world because we have our own capital we have our own brand name. Um, so we just sort of do our own work and build our own positions and share our research and it's a lot cleaner. Um, but it also just makes sense. For us, I also, like, just for me, I just think we do better research than the vast majority of other short activists. So we don't need other people's research. We don't need other people's brands, you know. Um, if we have a good idea, uh, I'd rather have Karis Dale share the research and rely on our credibility and do things the way, we, you know, we've learned to do things versus, um, you know, work with or rely on people who are less skilled at the strategy than I think um, I am and we are. So we just sort of do everything ourselves, but I do talk to them. You know, I, I, I think Andrew is a legend in this business. He's been doing this forever. He's very entertaining to talk to. He's always got like fun things to say. So I love talking to him. He's, he's a great guy. Um, and then I've known Nate and Hindenburg long before, you know, he launched Hindenburg. Um, yeah. oh, wow. um I, uh, you know, I know most of these players, especially when we were all exposing Chinese frauds and, and everybody was little um, and didn't have much capital. Um, it was more collaborative back then. Um, but then as we got bigger, it just sort of didn't make sense for us to share ideas or talk uh, talk about ideas with anyone else and just to do everything ourselves. And I think so that's been the case for more than 10 years now. What would you say your daily routine is like from right when you wake up to right when you go to bed? I know that there's like a lot that kind of like goes into probably a day for you, but I think a lot of people would be interested in kind of hearing. Um, you know, so we have a list of stocks that we like and uh, on the long side and, and shorts. And so, you know, we'll have positions on it. If you look at our 13F, we're a bit more diversified than other funds. Um, and then our watch list is even bigger. And so, um, you know, any given day, 
stuff's happening in the market. You know, some stocks are up or down 15, 20%. And, you know, I've already done the research on those names and, and will sort of add to those positions throughout the day. And so over the course of any day, you know, I'm sort of trading maybe like five to 15 stocks just based on the price moves. Um, and then, you know, um, so that's sort of what the trading looks like. And then we're always just trying to do research on new names, on interesting situations. And so I'm working with the team um, to make further progress on research on individual names and, and come up with more stocks that we like or um, you know, build new positions or on the short side, um, you know, find more shorts to add to our basket of shorts that were passively short, as well as to come up with names where we can engage in the short activism on. Um, so those are some of the things I do. On. Where are you, uh, where are you kind of like located? I think I saw like Miami, maybe. Miami. Yeah. New York and Miami. New York and Miami. Yeah. Do you like the nightlife in Miami? Do you ever go out, party, chill? Um, for any investors that's listening. I never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Miami is a fun city. He's like, I enjoy a casual coffee at 7 a.m. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> You'll find me at 5 a.m. at 11 <laughs> I had uh, I had a question that this is something that Alex always always asks, and you know, unfortunately, couldn't be here. But um, outside of trading um, stocks, you know, how do you diversify? Um, you know, your personal. Uh, well, like, do you, are you an investor in any other businesses yourself or do you like real estate or anything like that? Um, it's mainly, I mainly, uh, my, my capital is in just sort of like ETFs and then my fund. Um, you wow. know, I can't, I don't do personal trading outside of the fund. Nobody at the firm can buy individual stocks, um, outside of ETFs, um, if they're employed by the fund. And then that applies to myself. And, um, you know, so I have a lot of capital in the fund. And then just to diversify, I just, I just like buy the SPY um, or no. ETFs. Like the, I did a little bit of the RSP, which is equal weighted, the equal weighted SPY as opposed to, you know, in case like FANG underperforms over the next 10 years. But I'm, I'm mainly in ETFs and my fund. And then um, real estate is just, 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 my residences. Is, no. but I, I don't really invest in, I don't do much sophisticated outside of the fund just because, you know, I'm really focused on the fund. If, if the fund does well um, and, and generates returns, um, that's, that's, has a lot of impact on, on my income. And so, you know, that's just all my focus is. Yeah. yeah. How do you manage stress with investors and, you know, just overall markets? And, and how do you pull yourself out of that, you know, when you're at home, you know, with family and everything? Is, is it easy for you to to kind of separate the two? Yeah. With investors, you know, I enjoy that part of the business, speaking with investors, helping investors understand the story, helping investors just understand the markets. You know, uh, the reality is um, even when it comes to professional investors, um, you know, there's a lot that, um, is counterintuitive in this business, counterintuitive in the markets. And, um, you know, to be a good trader, to be a good investor, um, you know, it, it's a sophisticated enterprise that we're all engaged in. And so I feel like uh, I can work with my investors to understand, you know, how I think through things and, you know, help them think through um, their exposures to the equity markets um, based on what I know. So, um, you know, I enjoy that process and, and working with investors, uh, my investors. Um, and then uh, just in terms of the markets, yeah, I mean, I get stressed out like everybody else. And sometimes um, the best course of action is just to step away, you know, and do what you can to not get caught up in the daily price moves. Because if you're what I find is if I'm watching every tick on something or if I'm just really focused on, you know, how my portfolio is performing or, you know, my positions are moving, you know, I just get too short term focus and I get sucked into the market psychology, get sucked into like the current sentiment. Um, and, you know, that's it, it usually has negative outcomes, right? You want to try to be able to take a step back and and. Um, recognize that 
how people are thinking about the markets or your stock or or whatever they keep, the market environment, you know, that can that can change um you know, in any day and suddenly you go from really bearish sentiment to really bullish sentiment um, in the overall market and the sector and a given stock. And um, ultimately the fundamentals went out, you know, um, in my opinion. And so it's important to, you know, be able to take a step back. And so when I, when I start getting a little stressed, you know, I'll, I'll just take a day off, you know, honestly, it, it, it works. I think if you don't take days off and you're sort of doing it five days a week, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, I would just start being too short term in, in, in my thinking. Yeah. Um, when you uh, when you first kind of, uh, I guess, like, quote unquote, made it, did you make any like big purchases or anything like that? Or you just kind of stayed low key? I remember in 2010, um, I, yeah, so I, I, I launched with three hundred thousand dollars like not much um and uh you know i think it was sort of in the first quarter of 2010 so like a couple quarters in where i had a big trade or maybe it was mid 2010 a couple of my uh chinese shorts worked out and so i was in new york and i'm like you know what this is awesome i'm gonna go uh rent a convertible and go out to the Hamptons, you know, like with, with the girls. <laughs> I rented a Chrysler Sebring convertible. <laughs> that was my big step. You guys remember the, the Sebring? Oh, you know, yeah. The Chrysler just discontinued yeah. it a year after. But like, yeah, I got the Sebring convertible, went to Hertz, rented it, and like, you know, went to Surf Lodge back in 2011, you know, at Montauk. And my new in my like Sebring week weekend rental. <laughs> Pretty that's awesome, man. That's so um, good. <laughs> uh, do you have any hobbies outside of trading, or is it more just always focused on the market? Um, yeah, I don't have, yeah, I don't have too many hobbies. I'm just I've never. I don't think I've like developed a skill in the past twenty years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've learned. No new skills, no pottery, you know. No, honestly, I no, I, don't, I guess I don't. I'm just go to restaurants and. What's your favorite spot? Miami or New York, either one. Alex and I are big steak guys, and so is James. Oh so I mean, we love we love all the spots that you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's been pretty eventful. Yeah, I, in Miami, whenever anyone is visiting, I like to take them to. I think it's like Los Fuentes, the. Uh, Argentinian restaurant at uh, at Faena. Um, I think there's like three good restaurants in Miami, it's like Mandolin, <laughs> Boyade, and maybe it's just two, right? <laughs> right. But New York, New York. The culinary experience is is um, a little bit better. So I'd say my favorite restaurant in New York. I don't know. Um, I mean, you can go top three. You don't Don have to Angie pick one. Was pretty good. I haven't been there in a while, but um, that was good Italian. Um, that's all I got. I don't know. It's, it's tough. Stumped hmm? you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we went to uh, – James, what was that place that we went to, Alex and I, everybody? We went to uh, the – it was like a sushi slash steakhouse. It was like really posh in the uh, in the in the meat packer district. What? I, I, why am I blanking out right now? Two plates in New York. Yeah, I've only been I've been to Luger's with Alex and then um, Keen's. I can't remember. Oh, um, oh, uh, the, dude. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm blanking. Oh out. my god. Cat, oh, anyway, catch. Catch. Oh, catch. there we go. Catch. Fit. There's the steakhouse that they just opened is fantastic. It's the most Dude. ridiculously amazing thing I've had in my entire life. They're actually opening up a catch in Miami. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're opening up a catch in um, South Fifth area. Yeah. yeah. So, I wonder Alex moving. The place is going to be bumping. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, when we went, we did the. Uh, it was basically like the Wagyu tour where, Ugh. you know, you have the emperor and the black olive and everything like that. You know, I'm a huge foodie, man. So all we, my, my best friend from high school is an executive chef at a, at a place in Louisville. 
And so it's just like, dude, this is just, we talk, we start talking food. This could go for another two hours, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, Psalm, anything last, uh, any words of wisdom for the day traders of the community watching of any, uh, in the, to, you know, maybe let them capitalize on some market inefficiencies that you see. Lasting words of wisdom on the short side, don't lose all your money. Um, the market <laughs> be irrational much, uh, much longer than you can stay solvent. Right. 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 Don't be here on the short side and on the long side, you know, <clears throat> try not to invest in things that can go to zero. Right. So watch, watch leverage in your holds on the holdings on the long side. Um, you know, things like customer diversification, product diversification. Um, if you can find a business that like just can't go down, you know, can only go down so much. Um, you can always mm -hmm. leg into it as it goes down further. And yeah, those are my two pieces of wisdom. You know, Lovely. Those, I, find, I find those to be a little bit better than something that like where, you know, if a part of their business plan doesn't go well, you know, the, the stock disappears. And yeah. then you just keep buying it all the way down and then, you know, there's a lot more money and then you're there. buried. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any particular things that, that, uh, that Carisdale is doing right now in this market environment that maybe the retail world hasn't really seen blatantly such as, you know, everybody right now is like, Oh, it's going to capitulate. We're all dead. You know, we're going to turn into a bunch of zombies or whatever it is nanites in the air <laughs> but uh is there any particular outlook on the market that that you think people would really need to hear um well i, I think one of the reasons i've been a successful short seller um and still in business you know after 14 years is because i'm not a pessimist um you know i'm an optimist i think the market goes up and, and companies with pricing power and competitive advantages you know, they'll get bigger year after year. Um, and, you know, in this day and age, uh, there's going to be a bid for those companies and those stocks um, because um, with, as the market gets more efficient, you know, I think you, you're just going to see, um, you know, potentially less periods of just sort of irrational panic. Um, and so, so, you know, uh, I think every time sort of like, you see all that news flow about the world ending or this, that, or the other. Um, if it triggers, you know, severe price declines in, in companies you own, you know, I think I think those stocks can be good buys. And the dangers of shorting is just sometimes people are really um, all about doom and doom and gloom and just pessimistic on the macro and pessimistic markets and. And, you know, they it tends not to work well um, if you just sort of keep that bearish attitude, even when, you know, stocks become fundamentally attractive. But, you know, then there's those stocks where you've got the, the, the guy, the pipe guys that are like <laughs> looting shareholders, increasing their share count by a factor of 10 every week. And those stocks will just right. keep going to 99% every 12 months. Uh, yeah, GEVO. <laughs> Yeah, GEVO. Yeah, we all know the tickers. Yeah, <laughs> go along, good companies. And yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, man. Well, Sam, thank you so much. This has been truly enlightening, man. It's uh it's an it's an honor to speak to somebody so experienced in the market. And uh thank you so much. Thank you oh, so thank much. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Of course, man. Right. Thank you.